Now, I think one of the most significant internal side effects of Christendom, whatever that has been, has been mission drift of the worst kind. What started as this incredible movement of God's love, grace, and blessing became an institution. When movements become institutions, there are many dangers. Institutions often spend so much energy keeping up the institution that we forget the mission that was at the heart of the movement that started the institution. If you read Paul's letter to the church at Rome, you'll find that the charge levied against the people of God before Jesus came was that they forgot their mission over and over and over again. God said to Abraham, I'm blessing you and your offspring so that, that's mission, so that you can bless the world with my love and with my presence. The people heard, we are the chosen ones. That's all we need to know. When an institution like the church lives through generations where power, status, and wealth are consolidated again and again and again, we begin to hear the same thing. We are the chosen ones. That's all we need to know. What emerges is 2 Timothy 3, 5, the form of religion without the power thereof. The struggle for the church is that there is this image of Christianity that lives in our hearts at some level or another. Our culture thinks this image is the real thing, and they recognize it for the problem that it is. Most of us inside the church begin to think this image is the real thing, and we make it an idol. Well, we teach our children that this is the real thing, and they grow up wondering, why does this have so little bearing on my life? Meanwhile, I, I think Jesus wonders when Christians turned into Pharisees who did the same thing 2,000 years ago. Now, what exactly is this image into which we Western Christians have bought? This is hard to confess, and I could be wrong, but this is what, what I see. Beyond the caricatures of Bible-thumping preachers on the courthouse lawn, Christians tend to see themselves as protectors of morality and the keepers of a holy culture. Christians also tend to see themselves as protectors of God's righteousness and God's reputation, even though God never asked us to protect his righteousness or reputation. Christians further tend to see themselves as gatekeepers to the presence of God, boundary setters, if you will. Finally, a fourth thing, Christians often see themselves as the last line of defense in some unfolding holy war that threatens to destroy the kingdom of God, which we tend to equate with the institutional church as it has emerged in Christendom. In maintaining this powerful institution, it seems we may have constructed ourselves a reality which justifies the institution, not the mission. Most of that justification happens with building boundaries, keeping people out, keeping the list of what's right and what's wrong, and paying for a holy war that God has already won in Jesus. If you think about those four elements of the image of Western Christianity, which I just named, they are each rooted in our own idolatry, which says, just let us be God. We'll take care of it on behalf of God, and God won't have to worry about anything. That's dangerous thinking, which God has warned against since Adam and Eve made the same choice in the Garden of Eden. It is very hard for me to talk like this because I am a product of the final moments of Christendom. I want to go back to when teachers didn't give homework on Wednesday nights. I complain all the time about how people don't pay attention to what we're doing and saying in the church. And then I am convicted that what I'm really hungry for is a return to the heyday of the institution, not the power of the mission of God unfolding in Jesus at work in our midst. I ought to be hungry for that instead. When an institution begins to crumble... And I think the institution of church, as we've known it the last 40 or 50 years, is crumbling. Its people are faced with at least three choices. One, do nothing and let it fail. 
let it fall. Your pastor becomes a hospice chaplain, administering healthy doses of morphine by happy, sweet sermons until the end comes. Two, try to build the institution back to its former glory. Your leaders work very hard trying to put broken pieces back together and hounding the people until they do what they used to do or leave. <laughs> It's just life support, and it doesn't last very long. Most churches have been subconsciously doing this for 20 years or more. And there's a third choice that we have. We can remember who we are, why we're here, and what we are really supposed to be doing. We can remember the mission that birthed the movement and see if it still stirs our souls. We probably will find that it does and new life will emerge all over the place, only it might not look like that institution which has become so familiar. The discipleship pathway is our way of remembering who we are, why we're here, and what we're really supposed to be doing. Within the pathway, we find God's mission. We find this movement rooted in God's good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We discover again how to follow Jesus, not how to keep an institution. The church has been here before. The culture in which we suddenly now live is not unlike the first century in which the entire New Testament was written. Think through the last time you read the New Testament, especially the books of Acts and Romans. My goodness, the church of Jesus Christ was birthed into a messy, chaotic world. There were many gods and temples and idols. Humanity was a teeming mass of confusion. Everybody seeking to find something real and meaningful upon which to build their lives. Into that chaos came this ragtag bunch of uneducated and unprepared disciples. All they knew is Jesus raised from the dead and that God was doing something big to love and to bless the whole world. The followers of Jesus told their story again and again and again. People listened. People were intrigued. The religious people got mad and told them to stop, but they didn't stop. They couldn't stop. They had testimony of a life-changing encounter with Jesus who was raised from the dead as the final proof that God was doing something real in the world. You know all those stories, how the Holy Spirit moved, how people were healed, how eyes were opened, how folks were convicted, not from our judgment of them, that's not our job, but from the Spirit working on the inside. Communities of faith sprung to life, and this movement of God's grace and love and blessing spread across the land faster than any Facebook marketing campaign you've ever seen. This movement, which came to be called the way, as in the way of Jesus, is still changing the world. God is still loving and blessing the world back to life one heart at a time, in spite of the fact that Christendom is gone. A new season has come, a season of hope and real growth, a season of fruitfulness in the gospel and faithfulness to the true gospel, the one we find in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Think about it for just a minute. All of the stuff that has distracted us for so long is finally falling away, and we are left with the beauty of God's gospel and the call to live it out day by day in everything we do. By God's grace, the discipleship pathway is going to help us do just that.